Prior to beginning the activity, please be sure to review the faculty information and disclosure statements, as well as the learning objectives. After listening to the activity, complete the post-test by clicking the Earn Credit link in the episode description. Downloadable slides and resources are also available. The following presentation is copyrighted by Medscape. No use, broadcast, or recording of this presentation or any part thereof is permitted without the written authorization of Medscape. The following presentation is part of a certified educational activity provided by Medscape Education and supported by an educational grant from Regeneron Pharmaceuticals and Sanofi Genzyme. Hello, I'm Omed Hamid, co-director of the Cutaneous Malignancy Program at the Angeles Clinic and Research Institute, a Cedar sinai affiliate in Los Angeles, California. Welcome to this program titled Caring for Patients with Advanced Basal Cell Carcinoma, Perspectives from the Interprofessional Team. Today, I'm joined by Krista Rubin, nurse practitioner from the Center for Melanoma at Mass General Hospital Cancer Center in Boston, Massachusetts. And also, we have the pleasure of Vishal Patel, Director of Cutaneous Oncology at GW Cancer Center, Director of Dermatological Surgery, GW Department of Dermatology from George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences in Washington, DC. Hello, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to have you both here as we discuss basal cell carcinoma, its etiology, current treatments, and the future of care. Let's begin with a quick introduction to the epidemiology of basal cell carcinoma. It is, of course, the most common diagnosed malignancy, and about 4 million cases annually make it 80% of all of the non-melanoma skin cancers diagnosed. Despite its high incidence, it has a very low risk of metastasis, uh, but that can happen. So, Vishal, can you tell us a little bit about how these uh, basal cells carcinomas present and how we take care of them initially? Absolutely, thank you. Um, I, I like to start with telling all patients and even providers who may not be familiar with basal cell carcinoma, as you noted, it's the most common uh, malignancy diagnosed that the vast majority of them are uh, exceedingly easy to treat and we have a myriad of options to do so. It's, it's very rare that we progress onto the advanced or metastatic um, phase. Um, and so for patients who may have the disease or may have loved ones with it, I want to start by saying that it's exceedingly rare that you're going to have those really poor outcomes. Uh, the majority of lesions, 99.9% .9 of lesions, we will treat with some type of surgical or destructive therapy. Uh, and that can vary from dis local destruction, from just cutting the lesion out, wide local excision. Or certain tumors with higher risk features may require most micrographic surgery, which is a specialized technique where we can, we can excise the tumor and evaluate the whole margin. If patients can't tolerate surgery, they have the options for having radiation treatments with a curative intent. And even sometimes some lesions may not be treated because they may be in areas, they may be small and very low risk and, and there are other comorbidities of the patient um, that are at, at a higher concern. Um, and so historically speaking, these really are lesions that, are, that patients do well with. But as you noted, there is a very small number that become either advanced, uh, unresectable, which can have a, a, a wide definition depending on who you ask, or metastatic. And, and, and for that small number, we have to think about other options um, uh, of what to do. And how do you identify these patients? And so uh, for years, for decades, really, we didn't have a great way of identifying patients either at risk for becoming that or what that definition was. Um, I'll start by talking about a, uh, a recent study that has really changed our way of thinking about basal cell carcinoma, uh, a study out of two hospitals in, in Boston, Massachusetts, uh, Christus Hospital, um, and, and one of their partners that were able to look at uh, tumors that were either low risk and small in size, less than two centimeters or tumors that were greater than two centimeters. And now this is the first study that we've really had uh, that truly stratifies tumors with uh, in relation to risk of metastases or poor outcomes and death. 
Prior to that, basal carcinoma was because it is so ubiquitous, it's not included in the SEERS database. And this study of 248 low-risk tumors less than two centimeters and 248 high-risk tumors greater than two centimeters, where uh, the authors were able to show that tumors that were greater than two centimeters and located on the head and neck were invading deeply beyond the fat, uh, beyond the subcutaneous fat into muscle or, or underlying structures, had a significantly increased risk of nodal metastases, distant metastases, and death, or tumors that were greater than four centimeters in size. And so for the first time, we actually have an ability to utilize risk factors that we know are quantified with risk. Previously, we used risk factors through the NCCN guidelines that were known to have out, poor outcomes of local recurrence occurring, but these were expert consensus risk factors. And this study has really helped us set up a new alternate staging system as proposed by the authors, um, the Brigham, Brigham and Women's Staging System, that's very similar to what the group did for cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma. That works in parallel with the AJCC and helps provide physicians with a quantifiable way of identifying high-risk tumors. So those tumors that fall into that T2 group, it's with those risk factors I, I noted, they really are the ones we worry about um, progressing on to metastatic disease or might need radiologic surveillance to look for that at some point in their, uh, in their journey. Thank you. Krista, what do you say to these patients who are deemed high risk? How do you follow them in your clinic? And then what is the discussion if there's concern for recurrence? So it's a great question. And the, the new staging system or the staging system proposed by the Brigham and Women, Women's Authors really helps us think about um, how we are prospectively going to follow these individuals based on that risk. And it also helps determine imaging and uh, recommendations for regular visits. So our, our dermatology group often follows them. One of our dermatologists is also a medical oncologist. So sometimes he kind of um, steers the ship and, and helps us figure out which group is going to follow what radiologic imaging we're going to get, which is always a trick because many insurance companies are not yet up to par with, with um, following these high-risk individuals with you know, MRIs or, or a specific CT imaging. So we really try to look at the individual age, comorbidities, what are we going to offer this patient if indeed it seems as though the, the lesion is advanced? And so based on that, within our multidisciplinary tumor board program, we make those decisions about how we are going to follow each individual and then propose an individual care plan for them. And what's the discussion if there's concern of recurrence? So whether or not it's reasonable to proceed with surgery at that point, are we going to try to take somewhat of a neoadjuvant approach if there is a recurrence in a very technically challenging place, um, such as the, the eye or um, maybe along the nasolabial folds? We may think about those tumors a little bit differently than, say, somebody has somebody that has a lesion on on the ear or the neck. Um, so it really, at this point, with the new staging, with the new imaging, um, the, you know, the, the technology has advanced with imaging as well. So that's really um, very important in managing their care. So together, we make these decisions um, over the tumor board because it's not so simple and there isn't an answer for, you know, every category. We really have to individualize their care. I agree with you 100 percent that at our place and seems like everywhere, a multidisciplinary group, including pathologists, radiologists, radiation oncologists, medical oncologists, supportive care, nursing is important. And so that helps us transition to those patients who then are no longer candidates for surgical operation or radiation. And as we get to those patients who we deem locally advanced or metastatic, Historically, there has not been a standard therapy that has shown benefit. Uh, before the introduction of the therapeutics that we'll discuss today, you know, clinical trials or uh, platinum agents were used without a lot of data. So as we come to systemic therapies and the rationale and the roles uh, of immunotherapy and hedgehog inhibitors, it's important to note that basal cell carcinoma is a cancer that has significant mutations that are specific for it, like mutations in patch and smoothen. And those are the etiology of our understanding of how to target that mutation. And also high 
mutational loads we will talk about when we get to immunotherapy. In short, hedgehog inhibitors like sunitajib and vismotajib target the hedgehog pathway. That pathway includes patch and smoothened, and these are in over 90% of basal cell carcinomas. What we've understood is by inhibiting this pathway, we can cause uh, control of disease, partial regression of disease and complete response of disease. The trials that led to the approval of these two drugs, we'll talk about very quickly. Uh, Sunitajib was based on the BOLT trial. This was a randomized phase two study that looked at the 200 milligram and an 800 milligram dosing. It showed that the patients who were treated that were locally advanced did not have metastases had a significant response rate of 43%. The metastatics had about a 15%. At the 200 milligram dose, there was clearly no benefit going to the 800 milligram dose. And after these responses were seen and uh, the duration of response looked promising, there was the approval of this drug for the treatment of adult patients with locally advanced basal cell carcinoma. Vismotajib itself is a hedgehog inhibitor. And that trial was the Air Advanced trial that looked at locally advanced and metastatic patients, 104 patients in a phase two trial, looking at continuous dosing at 150 milligrams per day, and similarly showed a response rate of 60% in locally advanced and 48.5% in metastatic. Uh, basal cell carcinoma. And these drugs had a significant duration of response and through just phase two studies became approved. Uh, Krista, how do you talk to your patients about these drugs when they are uh, eligible for these therapies? So once the decision is made about whether or not we're going to proceed with surgery versus radiation versus um, oral therapies in medical oncology, so the patients will then be sent to um, our team in medical oncology to really do what I consider to be a pre-treatment assessment and education se session. Um, it, it can be challenging for older patients, 80s, 90s, because they are um, in their minds, this is chemotherapy, despite the fact that it isn't chemotherapy, and chemotherapy is very stigmatized. So it can take um, a fair amount of convincing them to really think about proceeding with systemic treatment um, with the understanding that this isn't chemotherapy, we're going to try this, see how you tolerate it. What is important is that the patients understand what our goals are. And goals can be very different um, based on what you mentioned earlier from the data. We know that some people will get a complete response, others won't. And for others, that's perfectly acceptable. If our goal is to try to shrink some of these nasty looking tumors, and that may be very different than a patient who has um, wildly metastatic disease, which we can see with basal cell, and we're really trying to manage symptoms. So a lot of my discussion and education has to do with our goals, and it's really important that we identify that early on among ourselves as, as the medical team. And then based on that, I'm able to help patients really try to understand what our goals are and how we're going to go ahead with treatment. Oral therapy, everybody thinks it's easy, oral therapy. But unlike intravenous therapy, where you come into the clinic and the nurses are administering those therapies, these patients go home with the medications, and we hope that they're taking it properly. So a lot of what I do is spent trying to understand what, what the patient's home environment is, and then how I can tweak their education to their particular um, set of circumstances at home and supports. So there's a lot that goes into it. Tell me more about the side effects of these drugs and how you manage them. So there, these agents are generally well tolerated in terms of an oncology perspective, meaning we don't see life-threatening toxicity as regularly as we do with some of the other agents that we use. But from a quality of life perspective, these medications can be very challenging. One of the most common side effects that we can see is muscle spasms, muscle cramps, which you think, okay, it's a cramp. It's a, 
but it can be really debilitating to the point that patients are um, finding it difficult to walk. And, and for many, these are older individuals that may already have a pre-existing fall risk. So we have to think about safety. Um, one of the other side effects that's pretty common, and in fact, I would argue that it's probably the most challenging is the dyskusia. Patients can have um, just this terrible taste. Some things taste salty, some things taste too sugary. And then for many individuals, they will lose their taste entirely, which can then lead to weight loss and nutritional issues. So these can be very, very challenging side effects to manage from a, an adherence perspective, but also from, um, it gets back to those goals of care. If we are trying to significantly regress a tumor, but we can't keep the patient on, on the therapy, then it poses a challenge as to what our next steps are. And that's why the multidisciplinary um, approach is extraordinarily important. Now, Michelle, how do you follow your patients on these drugs and uh, how do you manage these uh, adverse events? Any strategies? Yeah, I, it, um, there's, there's multiple strategies that we try to employ. They can use both strategies from a standpoint of, of the medication itself, as well as other potential medications that we can add to help alleviate some of those symptoms. Uh, before I talk about those strategies, I think Chris has brought up a great point, which um, goes back to the multidisciplinary team, is that the, these patients are so rare and unique that each one is very different, that we take a personalized approach in figuring out what may be a surgical candidate for one patient may not be in this, uh, the same for another patient. And also, the goalposts can constantly move as they respond to treatment, and maybe the, sur the, the lesion can be surgerized at a certain point, or they may, may not be able to tolerate things. So we're constantly reassessing that and going back to the multidisciplinary team and getting that feedback from the patient to see how they're doing. And, and Chris has really I isolated or, or uh, noted how important it is to, to have that education with the patient so that we can reassess that. But when those side effects are occurring, especially those, those main three, the muscle cramps, the dyskusia, the taste loss or taste alterations, and then hair loss, which can also be quite disfiguring and, and lead to a, a concerns. You know, patient, this is a disfiguring disease, but it may be hidden and maybe on their back and they're not showing it. But the, the side effects of taking medication and, and losing hair or having patchy hair can affect their quality of life. Well, the biggest uh, 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 strategy we have is alternate dosing, which has shown efficacy. Now, there's not a standard of care. There are lots of different regimens that have been uh, uh, attempted either every other day dosing, holiday periods of taking weeks or months off or or doing dosing uh, one week on, one week off or or different types of uh, um, recipes, so to speak. Um, we, we do uh, try those out with patients who are doing well or having a response and staying on the medication. And, and oftentimes that can help alleviate or bring those side effects down to a more tolerable level. Um, but occasionally that just ultimately does not uh, work or the patient progresses on therapy. And then when they progress, we have to consider other options. And until recently, we didn't have that. But I think uh, now we're really excited about what we have. That's great. Uh, I agree with you what you said here that these drugs really are, uh, they do take a multidisciplinary care approach and a one on one to flush out the side effects, the toxicities, and how we deal with them. Uh, hedgehog inhibitors have these limitations that responses achieved in certain populations are most often not durable. And then there is this uh, rate of discontinuation for patients who can't tolerate the adverse events. And so this is a great time to come back to the discussion about, you know, the mutational load of basal cell carcinomas. What we've seen is not only do they have these uh, classic mutations in patch and smoothen, but they are one of the solid tumors with the highest mutational loads. And what we have learned in our care and our understanding of immunotherapy is that patients with high mutational loads can exert a huge immunogenic response. And this is where we have garnered significant success with checkpoint inhibitors, such as PD-1 inhibitors. So after seeing the high tumor mutational loads, pathologically high levels of tumor infiltrating T cells, uh, clinical trials have uh, looked at basal cell carcinomas, and we have more recently come upon semiplumab, which is an anti-PD-1 inhibitor given intravenously 
uh, with responses in locally advanced and metastatic basal cell carcinoma, uh, leading to an approval for locally advanced basal cell carcinoma previously treated with a hedgehog inhibitor or for whom a hedgehog inhibitor is not appropriate and a accelerated approval for metastatic basal cell carcinoma. Christo, how do you fit this therapy into your patient's care? And can you expand on those patients where a hedgehog inhibitor is not appropriate? So I have to say, this has been incredibly exciting to be able to have a couple of choices uh, available for this patient population that previously just really had nothing. So again, it gets back to the goals of care and the multidisciplinary discussion. I think our job as providers is to be thinking about the immediate, but also having a contingency plan. So the way in which we somewhat strategize is to decide, okay, if a patient is going to start with a hedgehog inhibitor, well, I guess the question we, we ask our surgeons is to um, really give us an idea, is this really resectable or not? And, and what would um, the implications be? I mean, there are some individuals that just cannot tolerate anesthesia. So to be able to have a surgery, the anesthesia risk is too high. So we may um, just want to go right ahead to systemic therapy or we're looking to debulk a tumor. So how we think about what we're going to start an individual on based on the approvals um, is also done with what is our contingency plan. And for many of these individuals, they have these tumors that um, we have concern that if we don't get control, then, then we're just not going to have the ability to gain control. And what I mean by that is we may just need to go right to systemic therapy if we feel that um, the risk of toxicity is too high and we need to get control of this tumor quickly. Um, and we've done so for a number of patients in our clinic by just jumping right to semiplumab. And I, I will say it's for those individuals that benefit, they can benefit from this agent very quickly. In some cases, we've seen improvement after just one dose. Um, and I would say at least 75 to 80% of patients will have a significant response if they are going to respond within three doses. So it's been profoundly impactful for these folks that need improvement right away. And then if they have a significant toxicity and they're no longer able to continue, can we relook at the lesion and determine is it resectable um, or do we need to jump to a hedgehog inhibitor at that point or vice versa? So we're thinking for both plan A and plan B at the time that we're making these treatment decisions. Is that similar to, to how you think about or look at some of these patients in, in your clinic? Yeah, for me, I, I believe that, you know, the response rates that have been seen in locally advanced uh, uh, around the 30s and in metastatic around 20% gives you equipoise to say that they're similar. Um, and if you really look at these patients, a lot of them are frail and can't handle the side effects. Going in first with a semiplumab based on this approval, which is a approval that allows you to, as a physician, gain co garner control and then say, this patient can't tolerate this drug. So I have, and what we've seen has been similar, good responses. What we've also seen is that the durations of responses are longer with this immunotherapy than what we've seen with targeted therapy. So durable disease control may be what you want. You may not want shrinkage that then ultimately begins to grow. You may want to control this disease for extended periods of time. Uh, Vishal, any thoughts? Yeah, I was going to say that's a really key point because we always juxtapose this with squamous cell carcinoma, which can be uh, a different beast and, and, and can really blossom, be aggressive. And um, and and the, the surgical window, sometimes we're as surgeons, we're worried about what that window is and it feels shorter. Um, we were more concerned if we don't see a response and sometimes working with our Medicaid, uh, medical oncology colleagues, we're all trying to hold each other's hand and say, let's wait, and maybe there's a response coming. Let's not jump uh, and, and pull the knife out right away. And with basal cell, you, you really hit it on the head for, for me is that these patients, we don't have that necessarily uh, looming over us and, and that um, control of disease uh, that durability, durable response sometimes may be the goal rather than a complete response or a type of response that we are aiming for in squamous or melanoma for that 
for that example. And and, but, and I'm curious if uh, what your, your both of your thoughts are as to the response levels that we do see, because as a surgeon, as a, as a micrographic surgeon, being able to look at the histology, it's so interesting how there's such a, generally speaking, an inflammatory component, that tumor infiltrated lymphocyte component that we talk about with immunotherapy, with squamous cell carcinoma, but with basal cell carcinoma, we see such a variable histology and oftentimes that slow growth, the tumor just kind of seems to be in symbiosis, so to speak, at that tumor edge. Um, and I'm curious if maybe some of those response rates and the differences are seen is because of how immunogenic the tumor may be. And so when we think about that durable response, we're just really trying to keep it at bay because that may be the, the end result. And that's surely how I think about it. And Krista, I mean, uh, when you're talking about with patients, that may be the goal setting you're talking about is we're just trying to keep it comfortable and keep you in a functional way without losing an eye or an ear or, 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 or having a wound that's open. And that's what our goalpost uh, really is for these patients. I agree 100%. And what's been interesting is that's been our intention when we start the therapy. And then we are pleasantly surprised by just this dramatic regression. And in some individuals, we've then gone, we've gone in and resected the area. And we've been surprised to find that there's no viable tumor, which has been really exciting. And we're able to salvage significant parts of individuals' faces or, um, you know, just locations that previously our surgeons would have been very concerned about nerve damage, et cetera, et cetera. So it's been uh, amazing to have these, these systemic options that are making a difference. And I think as a surgeon, that's also uh, exciting because we, we have clinical trials again in the square cell space, looking at neoadjuvant approach and being shocked at seeing no tumor in the resected area. And for basal cell, that really changes the game because now we can think about maybe utilizing this upfront in a new management approach. And I'm sure that's going to be the next frontier of, of exploration, but that really opens it up because with hedgehog inhibitor therapy, there has always been a concern of either patchy response or potentially since it leads to cellular senescence to some degree, maybe a false negative margin that when you stop the therapy and you've done a resection that's smaller, you may be leaving behind a tumor that's gonna recur in a year or two in, in, a, in an area that has a large resection or a large reconstruction. I don't know, uh, Omid, what you think about neoadjuvant versus adjuvant approaches for hedgehog and or immune checkpoint and inhibitor therapy when thinking about these patients? One of the things that I'd say is I agree with you that the, the ability to have two options has changed the game. Uh, I do think that the future comes in looking at ways to combine them both and also take what we've learned with other solid tumors, uh, the combination of radiation and uh, immunotherapy, the combination of direct oncolytics or injectable therapies with immunotherapy and go forward. But I hesitate because we, when we spoke with the, about the hedgehog inhibitors, we spent some time talking about toxicity. And I think that's also important here as you talk about uh, adverse events or immune related adverse events with these immune checkpoint inhibitors uh, that can target PD-1 and other targets like semiplomab. Krista, what do you tell your patients? What do you look out for and how do you manage these? So again, because of the age of the patients, I try to keep it as brief and as simple as possible. And so really what I'm trying to educate them about is how these this agent, semiplomab, really just manipulates the immune system. We are trying to re-educate the immune system. And because we have immune cells everywhere in our body, we can have toxicity anywhere in our body. So I'm asking them to, to report, not to complain, but to report about anything that's different from their baseline. If they, for example, are an individual that never has a rash or is never itchy and all of a sudden they just have a, a rash all over their belly or their back, I want to know about that. If they normally are able to run up a floor, walk up a flight of stairs without feeling winded and now they go up a couple of stairs and they're winded, I want to know about that because we can see the development of things like pneumonitis, colitis, dermatitis, any of the itises are suggestive of an inflammatory side effect. And it's often the patients that have the best responses that are the ones that are going to have the most significant or, or the most frequent side effects. So it's not necessarily a bad thing to, to have side effects. And I really spend a lot of time educating patients and caregivers 
or family members about what this means, why it's so important to have open and ongoing communication with these patients and how to reach us. What happens on a weekend? It's not so easy sometimes to get through to the major center. So, so how, do they, um, how do they reach us and what are we going to do about it? Um, more is not necessarily better. Sometimes we've seen fantastic and durable responses after just a couple of doses. So we don't have to continue for a year or two or three. And so just educating and setting expectations and repeating this at every visit is really what I found as much the most crucial aspect. Okay, so as we come to a close, I want to just review what we've talked about. So the ideas that have been brought here is that we now have newer therapies for locally advanced and metastatic basal cell carcinoma for the population of patients who cannot benefit from radiation or surgery. Effective communication with patients along with education and a multidisciplinary approach can ensure optimal treatment and optimal outcome. A patient education was discussed here. And of course, a clear review of the two drugs that are leading the field here, hedgehog inhibitors, uh, that target mutations in the tumor and immune checkpoint inhibitors that target the immune response from the high neoantigen load and the high mutational burden of these tumors. So at this time, we do have options, uh, combinations coming, clinical trials available. And the future, I think, is uh, in heading in the right direction. I'd like to thank my colleagues here uh, Krista Rubin and Vishal uh, Patel for a lovely, lively, and educational discussion. I want to thank you all for tuning in and participating in this activity. Please continue on to answer the questions that follow and complete the evaluation for this activity. Thank you. <laughs>